like this. But, you know, it's not a real horror film. It, it's yeah. like, you know, a classy horror film. Yeah, it, um, it's not a it's a cool mom. It's not a regular. Yeah. Mom. <laughs> yes, recording remotely um, but this is the end of our November series where we are talking to our fellow horror lovers in the podcasting community we have two phenomenal guests that we're super big fans of and we love their work either in the podcast and also their written work all kinds of things that they're doing because their hands are all up in the horror world and they have great big brains <laughs> so we're gonna uh, invite them in we have Joe and Trace of the Horror Queers Hello. Hi, thank you for having us. Yes. <laughs> Big um, excited. <excite>. Welcome. <laughs> I love your phrasing of um we have our hands all up in the horror community. I just have like yeah, a visual I, of like I got a little worried there. <laughs> Listeners who will get excited by that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Same. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. We're like I said, we're we're big fans. I love your show, um, and it, and it's also like a a fun thing because your show is also kind of like a thread through the horror community as well. Like when I find fellow horror lovers who like listen to podcasts, it's like yours always comes up on that list of like, what are they listening to? They're like, yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> that makes us feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I just did a, uh, like a study for, um, about how horror is queer. Mm. Um, and it was like, that was like one of the conversations and I was like, <clears throat> The horror queers, they have a whole podcast. <laughs> I'm talking about that. Um, you had it. Uh, so it's yeah, it's great. Our whole point for this series was to, you know, invite people who are, you know, commentating and taking more like analytical looks at media. You know, it's it's totally fun to kind of just watch things and enjoy them but there's mm -hmm. also like you know really good nuggets when you're like really looking and you're like hey <laughs> wait a second this is saying this is something me. <laughs> yeah. there's more to this dumb film than i ever expected <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and that's in that there's exciting things for that. And then there's also times when you're just like, why didn't you do more? <laughs> you could have done better. Yeah. The missed opportunities is a phrase oft repeated <laughs> on our show. Oh, <laughs> uh, so sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. O oftentimes we just wonder, like, what could this have been? were in someone else's hands or someone else was in that room saying like, hey, maybe don't write that. <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe real people don't behave like that or like this is just a character trope it's a it's a combination right of like creator and studio and also time period you know like we'll, mm -hmm. we watch a movie from the 80s we're like well this is really not great but it's also the 80s so it's like you have to like kind of like make that middle ground there meet them halfway yeah, yeah. people weren't making as much efforts to consult I find particularly like marginalized groups where they're like, oh, I've, I've got a black friend. I heard of a trans person one time. I'm going to write a whole movie about them. And you're just like, oh, God, no, please no. don't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Really think about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we I think we get that when we're even just talking about like 90s or early 2000s. We're mm -hmm. like, oh, this was like colorblind time. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. When people thought like if we're making fun of everyone, then it's fair. You know, yeah. we can, and it we're wasn't just, it's fun, you know, it's just yeah. humor I, and comedy. I know that's actually a good distinction, though, because I think like if you're looking at the 70s and 80s, it's like it's just kind of ignorance. Whereas, though, yeah. like there's something about like the late 90s, early 2000s or even most of the 2000s where it's like it's almost like borderline mean. It's not even ignorant. It's like, no, you knew what you were doing. You were just being a dick about it or you yeah. couldn't be yeah. bothered. Like, yeah, yeah, we put Usher into this film, but we didn't give him jack shit to do. <laughs> 
it's definitely that where it's like we did the bare minimum so yeah. mm-hmm. it's a yeah, really, yeah. that excuses the rest of what we just did right <laughs> like, yeah i think uh yeah. it's sorry <laughs> it's definitely defined no, by like what our uh what is it called? Where it's a TV, but it's real reality TV is of the mm-hmm. time where you have like the early two thousands is like everyone's mean. You have like the yeah. what's it called? All those shows on MTV where like they're all just the whole thing was them just being awful to each other. And then you have like reality TV now where everyone's voted up if they're like really nice. I don't yeah, know if anyone's yeah. seen the circle, but it's like if if oh, you God, get if yeah. you're nice to each other, then it's like oh, then you win. So it's like the well, culture shift has changed in that way. Yeah, it's it, I always think like Big Brother when it's like the ones that blend in, they're the ones that get voted out first because people are like, no, that's like that's the strategy. That's this, it's also not good TV, right? You don't want people yeah. to blend in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so for our listeners, uh, I will do a brief introduction from what we found online of you all. <laughs> and then I'm going to uh, extend uh, the question of you all kind of explaining what you do um, and what people will find if they tune in. So um, every week, Joe Lipset and Trace Thurman tackle a horror film with LGBTQ plus themes, high camp quote quotient or both for these lifelong queer horror fans there's as much value in serious discussions about representation as there is in reading a ridiculously silly fun horror film with a yes queen mentality just know that at no point we'll be getting baba shook <laughs> which is my favorite <laughs> thing <laughs> oh gosh i remember when we tried to put that in in every episode and then we were like okay we need to cut this down that's like yeah. 40 <laughs> seconds and trying to say the word well, quotient every week it's like no get rid of it, that it's i think it's because people because like, we'll have guests on and we'll have a movie and then people are like oh well, that's not really queer and it's like yeah but like the movie doesn't have to be queer for us to cover it like we're bringing the queerness in but if we can find something queer about it by all means like let's do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> agreed, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess we kind of get that too, just in the realms of like horror, because we don't do just horror. We do right. other, like we covered her, right? But it was more uh, like okay. the horror yeah. of that topic. Like, right. like, what is the horror of, you know, having a girlfriend that's AI? Like, what does yeah. that really say about us as people? So like, we get, we get similar things where it's just like, oh, it's just... It's, no, it's I, in the vein. I, no, I, I think that works though, right? Where it's like the, the film itself may not be classified as horror, but like the subject matter is kind of horrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, agreed. Um, <laughs> well, why don't you tell our, our viewers and listeners a bit more about you two, um, when and where they can hear you and what they should find when they listen. Okay. Trace always <laughs> kicks us over to me, so. Uh, He's yep. really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> So Horror Queers, it began as an editorial series on Bloody Disgusting. And then over the course of a year, we decided we were going to turn it into a podcast form. And then we kind of slowly phased out the editorials because we found that people just gravitated to the podcast a lot more. And it allowed us a greater flexibility to actually bounce off of each other. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the main thing is that, you know, the podcast comes out once a week. As Trace said, we try to do queer based films, but a lot of the time we find interesting avenues like we're really interested in the intersectionality of different types of films uh and we like to bring on guests that will complement the fact that we are two bitchy white gay dudes so uh you know we like to bring on women and uh marginalized people so that they can round out our discussion and then yeah depending on the film we'll uh Sometimes we read it to Phil, sometimes we laud it, but a lot of the times we find really interesting avenues that we didn't expect until we do the deep dive. Well, and I think too, like, I'm trying to think of an example of something recent, like an episode that we've done recently, like, you know, like we, we just did William Friedkin's Cruising, which is a very explicitly queer film. Yeah. But then we also have like, uh, this week, so this episode comes out on Tuesday. So yeah, this week we're doing, um, Candyman 2, which may not have a lot of queer content, but the director himself is Bill Condon, who's a gay man. So we, mm-hmm. we've also gotten really into looking at queer creators who are making non-queer horror films and how they even Hocus Pocus we did recently, cause that's a gay director. Yeah. Um, um, and how they can inject their queerness into the film where it may not be like something your average viewer would pick up. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's so really great. cool. 
<laughs> yeah, we we have a um, an upcoming. So our it's funny. So our next series after this is so starting in December is our uh, queer horror um, series. So we'll do oh, four wow. different um, specifically like looking at horror that's queer. Mm -hmm. um, and we cover Thelma. And I, as like part of like our research was, was like we were looking on Bloody Disgusting and found your conversation yeah. about it. And I was just like, yes, I'm not the only one who feels this way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's yeah, such a it's weird so film. Like I, yeah. I love that film because it's so complicated. Like mm -hmm. there's almost something more interesting to talk about films that try and don't quite succeed. Cause I know people who love that film. They think it's a, a perfect queer horror film. And I find so many things just get under my skin. And I think, yeah, like it's a great example of a queer horror film that's trying, not getting everything right, but I want to see more films like that, which are actually being audacious and risky. Yeah, I think we have that same feeling with um, Spiral. Where it was oh, like, yeah. Oh, so there's so much here. There's like such potential and it was so great. And then it was like... It it spiraled out <laughs> we were like wait hold on yeah it spirals an interesting beast too though because so one of the writers in that film is colin minahan who uh wrote and directed he definitely directed but um yeah. what keeps you alive which is a, yeah. les a lesbian horror film but you could argue oh well like he, there were no real like real queer people like on hand to do this and with Spiral, he actually did bring on a queer co-writer. So and you and you can feel that in the film. I I like both those films, but you can see a difference in yeah. how much the queerness is like involved in the plot of the film and the characters themselves. Yeah, it feels like he took a note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, what keeps you alive didn't have. Uh, yeah, like he wrote it like as if it was a guy and a girl. Like he didn't yeah. write yeah. it as if it was intentionally two women who were in love. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like there's, you know, benefits to that because it was like a, a great story. Um, and it's nice to just kind of see characters right? like, and <laughs> yeah. not have it be like, hey, look at us. We're doing this thing. Yeah. Um, but it's also like you, you do kind of miss uh, like misrepresent or just like don't give them enough credit by it, making them fully that. <laughs> it's funny because I, I, I mean, and this may be a controversial statement, but I always feel like you're not going to please. I mean, I, no, it's true. You're not going to please everybody because here's the thing. If you have a movie like What Keeps You Alive where like their queerness is just part of it, but it's not really like their struggles aren't about their queerness. That's really good. But then there are some people that are like, well, you're not really doing anything with this. So that's a problem. Yeah. Um, I do understand both sides of it, but yeah, at the same time, like I think because Joe and I are covering so many like films, because we're, so many films where queerness is so, so front and center, it's, it is sometimes nice to have it be like, oh, um, they are queer and that's it, but that's not like, like well, we just did The Craft Legacy, you know, and there's a trans character on that, but like this girl's struggle isn't about her being trans. It's There's like a yeah. throwaway line where she's like, oh, I'm trans, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she's also not like a very fleshed out character where you think, right. okay, well, is that the trade-off? Like, is, you know, normalcy, quote-unquote, means that we don't get that kind of rich interior lives of some of these characters. And I think part of it is just we're finding this with all, basically all non-white heterosexual stories. It We're so starved for good representation that it becomes challenging. Like, we want these films to do everything and and anything uh so when it isn't giving us everything we're like okay well spiral could have been great but you know it basically had to carry the weight of all of these like queer yeah. expectations yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but it definitely is like that because it's like if we had more right then we can have those like flops and just be like i like it because like it's camp and it's you know it's horror it's fun and i can have fun with it because there's not the stress of like finally oh my god characters <laughs> yeah but yeah if i had a nickel though for every time like we get comments or even i see comments on blood disgusting that are like Ugh, can we just have a fun horror movie like i don't want political things in oh my, my horror god. movies get and it's just like here. i don't uh, i mean i get it but <laughs> I, that's where yes. the whole elevated horror thing came from, where I was like, oh my God. that's not <laughs> that's the most privileged thing you could say about horror. It's like, the also, whole like, thing I mean, is that. Yeah, right? And it's also like, I mean, okay, cool. So people are acting like, I don't like using the term elevated horror. It's just a horror movie that maybe yeah. is like, I. it's not like, what. Well, I don't even know. But, like, you could even say, like, okay, well, cool. Like, something like Don't Look Now, something like The Exorcist. Like, if you're going to, like, 
like that could all be termed elevated horror, yeah, quote unquote. Prestige. Like, presti- pre- there you go. I think that's a better way of putting it, honestly. I think prestige is better because it's clearly like has higher aspirations than just like, I don't know, your standard 80s slasher film. Yeah, but it's such, it's such a read, right? Like, I find it often comes from people who don't actually like horror films right. that much or who aren't oh, yeah. involved in the horror world. Not to say always, because we do still encounter it among the folks within the community, but I just think it, it diminishes the idea of what horror can be because then horror just becomes this one big amalgamous blob. And you're like, no, there's all these different subgenres. It's easily the most malleable and fluid of the genres like and yeah i mean when people try to take the political aspect out of it i think they're often misrepresenting what the genre is capable of it's the most progressive genre in the biz well i think it's also a combination you're right joe what you were hitting at earlier it's people that don't like horror that like it's like if you call it elevated horror it's like a way for them to excuse themselves like oh i like this but you know it's not a real horror film it's like you know a classy horror film yeah Um, it's not a it's a cool mom it's not a regular yeah You know, because a lot of our shows is just about, um, like, we talk about the films, but rarely we're talking about the the core concept of it. So we're mm-hmm. just like, okay, we're, we're covering, you know, Snowpiercer and Parasite, but we're talking about the horrors of classism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever we have those, like, conversations, people are like, wait horror is this like mm-hmm. zombies are actually you know about consumerism like you know or like, well, and you're like yeah it's fascinating right though because yeah like what you're saying like it, it's just a malleable flexible genre and so that's why honestly it's much like how like the queer community like kind of queer is like that umbrella for all the letters of that anagram for me calling something a genre film like when people are like oh that's not really horror i'm like okay i don't want to get into talk about like whether jaws or seven is horror or not they all fall under this genre umbrella for me so it mm-hmm. counts and i i what i find so fascinating about this genre is that there is a community built around it right like the fan base is so vocal they're so connected they also fight a lot and they're also sometimes petty <laughs> but then they're also sometimes great but you don't you don't see that with any other film genre like there's no romantic comedy community there's no oh my god you don't know you don't right. know <laughs> but i mean like <laughs> but i love romantic comedies i mean maybe there is like a rom-com on twitter that i'm missing out on which oh my god i need to go see if that there is everyone let us know <laughs> But it's, 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 you know, you don't see that with any other film genre, really. And I yeah. listen, y'all's listeners, I apologize if y'all disagree. Shoot, sh- come at me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> he loves to fight, so really, come at him. <laughs> Do it. I want to watch. Because um, I agree, I agree. I think um, that horror, because it's like in its own little fringe kind of mm-hmm. area on the offset, it's not really being patrolled in the same way. Like, I feel like we just kind of are in the shadows. And yeah. so we get away with saying a lot more. Yeah. We can like put it all out there because only we're going to see it, you know? <laughs> like mm-hmm. only the people who want to see it are going to see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's like... Uh, I. I don't want to say like snootiness. <laughs> oh, no, say it, say it. <laughs> you're right. You're a hundred percent right. Like this is like when you're in here, you're like no, like you do, you just don't get it. <laughs> like you kind of do feel like you're a little bit. Well, little then you're going into gatekeeping a little bit too, right? Yeah. Where it's like because because also like because horror itself is kind of like the bastard redhead stepchild of the film world people that are very protective of it and so Mm -hmm. they're like oh i i grew up like you know since i was 10 watching all these movies i know the latest obscure horror film like from like 1972 that you've never heard of so you can't be in this cool kids club because when i was growing up i was not in the cool kids club because i thought people thought i was weird for liking horror so it's this weird like developmental thing where it's like okay well now some of us have become the bullies of wanting to keep people out of this really awesome community yeah yeah Instead of saying, like, there's something for everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. The, I think to the point where we've we've tried to make deliberate efforts, like, we have a Facebook group, and our group is actually really, really great, but every once in a while, somebody will pop in and be like, I'm watching this movie for the first time. Has anybody else ever seen it? And they're talking about The Exorcist or Scream. <laughs> and you're like, oh, <sighs> yes, we absolutely have. But... Part of it is just reframing your brain a little bit to be like, in, instead of saying like, oh my God, how have you not seen that before? What the fuck have you been doing with your life? You switch it and you say, that's so exciting for you. Yeah. Report back. Tell us everything about, you know, what that experience was like. So I think part of it is we can be really mean to each other. And I mean, like a lot of things on the internet, we could just do with a little more kindness. 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That was so wholesome. That's so real. <laughs> like, just like, cause that's so true. Like, that's totally how people should react. It should be like, oh, you don't know the end of The Sixth Sense? What a surprise and delight you're yeah. about to experience. Yeah, you're going to have like, such what? a delightful time. Yeah, oh, it's whenever be I so meet fun. someone that's like never seen a Scream film, I'm like, oh my God, wait, can I show them to you, please? Can I please c- come over? Let them be like, like, obviously pre pandemic, but like, please, like, let me show you all these movies <laughs> because I want to like watch you like experience this film so bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love watching people yeah. watch films uh, to the mm-hmm. point where it's like people who are with me get like freaked out. They're like, can you watch the mo- movie? Why are you staring at me? I'm like, I like, know what's about to happen. <laughs> and I want to know how you'll react. <laughs> yes. I mean, there's uh, there's like two forms of watching, right? It's you're watching the movie, but you're also watching the person watching the movie waiting for their reactions. It's amazing. So I do this really annoying thing, especially in slashers when it's like a whodunit quality where like about like when the third act begins, oh, I'll God. like pause the movie and ask my friend, like, okay, who do you think's the killer? <laughs> Run down the list. Who's a red herring? Because I don't want them to be like, after it happens, after the reveal happens, I don't want them to be like, oh, I knew that. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to check on you. <laughs> it's really obnoxious. It's <laughs> the problem track. is, Trace has no poker face. So no. if people get it right, he's just like, Brah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm just like this. The whole time. <laughs> I love that thing. face. <laughs> and I'm like, I know something's gonna happen because she's looked over at me like ten times faster. Like, you know, we're just like, something's, like, coming, something's, something's coming. Something's coming. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I guess. I'm just like, did you see that? And I'm, yes. We were in the same room together. <laughs> I saw it before. Because, like, what if I don't react appropriately? (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, huh. And then she's like, that was the most intense moment for me. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I've literally paused it and made people rewatch if they don't react. Yeah. Did you miss this? Your reaction was way too muted. You didn't see it. That's so true. (laughs) You clearly didn't see it. Oh, I didn't even think about that. It is added pressure, though, on, like, the friend who's watching the movie for the first time, right? Like, oh. Or, like, what if you don't like it, right? And you have to, like, sit there and be like. Oh, it was okay. <laughs> it's like opening presents in front of people. Yes. Oh, a scarf. It's so warm. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. another homemade sweater. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's so true. Um, I, always, like, when people, like, when we, you know, promote ourselves as, as horror, I'm always, like, people are always like, I don't like horror. Right. And yeah. Kind of yeah. Push it off. And it's like, that's not true. <laughs> you just like what you think of horror is like a very specific thing. Like you think of 80 slashers. slashers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, so you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like, Let me convince you otherwise. I mean, and we discuss it a lot, too, where it's like, you know, people. Are, oh, what's a really scary movie? I'm even low to even say that anymore, because mm-hmm. like much like comedy, scary is so subjective. And so, like, you know, you can have someone walk into a movie like Hereditary and be like, oh, that was really boring. But yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, because oh, it wasn't scary because I'm like, OK, well, because what you're thinking of scary is like a bunch of jump scares. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then those same people are the ones that are complaining like, oh, I'm really tired of lazy jump scares. I wish something could really get under my skin. I was like, OK, well, Hereditary is right fucking there. And <laughs> yeah. but, but you think it's boring when it's just a really like dread inducing film that is scary if you mm-hmm. were in that scenario. But because it's not going boo you're not registering it as scary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 What's and weird. Was... Oh, sorry. we keep doing this because oh, of the delay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what I was going to say, it's like, it's really weird that the like mainstream horror community that's like at conventions and stuff is all the people who are like the slashers and like, who are like Freddie Jason and whatever. And then you have yeah. like, but they're, the, the, the same people are like, we don't like horror. And it's like, but the horror is so big. How is there not just a convention that's like oh. bigger that like actually includes all these I will tell things. you my, con- no, my controversial opinion on that is, though, the people that are like, oh, like, new horror isn't as good. I wish it was back to the classic shit. And oh I'm like, God. okay, but you're also like lauding Friday the 13th franchise, which is a really fun franchise, but as like high art. And it's not <laughs> like those are not good movies, you know, but these like... <laughs> no. it, 
It's just so bizarre to me. But yeah, you're right. It, 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 I, I always liken to being a horror fan to being a drug addict, where you're like always chasing like the high, uh, the oh, higher okay. high. <laughs> Ooh, no, I'm glad you were able to like very quickly clarify that. <laughs> no, because you know when you you you're, because you're like, oh, I'm desensitized to scares, to violence, right. to whatever. So you're looking yeah. for the next extreme, something that'll mm-hmm. make you feel something, make you feel scary. Just like again, when you're on like drugs. You are looking for something <laughs> that will make you alive. like higher as you yeah. get um what's a oh my god, not adaptive, what's it called? Oh as your tolerance builds up. Tolerance, that's that's yeah. what it is. I actually find that that increasingly becomes it, it becomes a problem too, like now during the pandemic, because they're just dropping content so quickly. Like I was trying to keep mm-hmm. up with October to the point where Trace and I developed a spreadsheet with <laughs> friends who were covering films being like, OK, everybody, every time you get an email, put a film in here because we can't keep track otherwise. Yeah. But it was a rush to like, have you seen his house? Why haven't you seen it? Like, you've got to see it before you get the ending ruined. And it's like it came out yesterday. <laughs> I need everybody to. <laughs> To slow the roll and shut the fuck up. I've got other plans today. I can't get to his house yet. <laughs> yes. We had that same, uh, the same feeling. Cause I mean, we're doing this. So it was like, on top of the fact that like October, we were so dedicated to like, we're just going to chat with people. Like the films are kind of like on the back end. And right. We already had our, our films for December picked out. Mm-hmm. So we're like, whatever. And October just came and I was like, huh, this, this. I was like, I have not finished Haunting of Bly Manor. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I think, suck. I think there were what, like 70 horror films that came out in October. Like it was, it was outrageous. insane. Yeah. We haven't seen all of them by any means. No, we, no. we haven't yeah. either. <laughs> I still have not seen his house. I, I haven't either. <laughs> it, it's really good. <laughs> Netflix that's there, it's like the first trailer that pops up. I'm like, stop. I know. Okay, I know. Yes, thank you, Netflix. I don't need to be trolled by you. Yes, we have like a whole like we do spreadsheets and I've just been putting in like films as I see. I'm like, oh, this is a good one. Here's what the theme is or, you know, and it is like tripled in size this year, Yeah. Um, which I guess, you know, and I imagine it's going to get even like larger because of life is horror that Mm -hmm. 2020 has been that there's no doubt that we're going to get an influx of horror because there's so much content, (laughs) there's so much potential. And it's, I always think like, you know, horror goes through phases, you know, where it's like, oh, horror is in right now. Horror is not in right now. And I do. And also with the quality of films and, you know, this may be a bit of a generalization, but I always find that in times of political turmoil like you tend to get better content from horror mm-hmm. creators yeah. so like i do think that like during the trump presidency like we got better horror because people were actually scared of their everyday yeah. lives whereas yeah. you know when obama's presidency you know a lot of creators were more content and so we were seeing maybe m- m- more lazy efforts than you would normally see and that's of course not applying to every single film that came out during that time oh for yeah, sure cover your ass cover your ass no, no i know but but, but, <laughs> but, but, but i mean th- that's just what i've observed and but i think though um even with the pandemic, you know, we're granted, of course, we're probably going to see a lot of pandemic movies. And the movie we're talking about today is very timely, given that that whole subject matter. Yeah. But I think we're going to see a lot of content come out, a lot of really good horror come out, because, again, we're all like going crazy right now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of paranoid thrillers, I think, in mm-hmm. the near future. Mm-hmm. Oh, that terrible, like Maybe Michael some... Bay one coming out with AJ. What's his name? Kappa? AJ Kappa? Yeah, Riverdale guy. Oh. It's like a sound unseen or something. Uh, it's, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> no thanks. Yeah. No, I agree. I think there'll probably be some like home invasion. Mm. You know, yeah. Like that feeling of not, you know, being safe in your own home or isolation. Yeah. It's even scarier because they could be bringing the virus in. Like, I feel like that's going to come yeah. into play. Like, that it's not even just regular home invasion. It's like there is this whole other layer. Contagious the, home invasion. But then on the flip side, though, we're having like a slasher resurgence. Like we're having like, you know, we're having Scream 5. We're having a new season of the slasher TV show. Seth Rogen's making us like a slasher meta horror mm-hmm. film called Video Nasty. Like I it, it's just bizarre. Like the, the, the ebbs and flows that all the subgenres of horror go through, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's and it's exciting. I, I get excited for any kinds. Um, I'd say our least favorite are the slashers. Like we'll watch them, but it's not something where I'm just like I gotta go. See, <laughs> and, I, interesting. I, I think for me, like a slasher is very much like an Agatha Christie mystery. Like, I, but granted, that was more. I mean, it happened in the '80s, but you know, I think Scream was what really got me into it. Where I'm like, oh, like I want to know who the killer is. So while it's definitely easy to make a dumb slasher, which is it's just so episodic, right? Just going from kill to kill to kill to kill, but. I, I, I find slashes very fun because you have the horror on top of the ooh, who done it, the who done it mystery. Whereas like with yeah. zombies, I think zombies I was burned out on for a long time. Go ahead. I think the Sorry. problem is, is that a lot of slashers right now aren't doing red herrings and mysteries. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, like as much as I love things like Happy Death Day, it's like, OK, there's a little bit of red herring there. But really, I think the emphasis is is less on who is the killer and more like. Who will survive and what will be left of them? Uh, I would argue that that film particularly is more about that lead character's right. emotional journey. Um, which, yeah. But you're right, though. There is a trade-off, though, in that, yeah, then the identity of the killer and the slashings themselves become a bit less important wah-wah. to the plot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which horror fans are going to walk into that like, that wasn't very slashery. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. true. It's just Groundhog Day with you know, right. some stabbing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> some stabbing. <laughs> I would say I, there was a really good slasher TV show. Is it the one? Cat and I. Yeah. What was that called? It had I two don't seasons. Know. They were totally different, like like arcs. But I remember one was like they were at a like a ski resort or something. Like slasher. Was, Called? It's called Slasher, yeah. So yeah. There, there's actually three seasons. Um, but but the, the thing is, the first season aired on Chiller, and it wasn't very good. Um, mm-hmm. But then Netflix picked it up for season two and three, and they just renewed it for season four, and it's yep. going to be like people on an island. But yeah, Slasher season two and three are like really fun. I, I think it's interesting how you can adapt the Slasher genre, subgenre in the TV format, and it doesn't mm-hmm. like yeah. stretching You know what should be an 80-minute film to what, 10 episodes, 10 hours? Yep. And you still make it entertaining and like, consistent and not feel like it's drawn out like that's skill to me yeah and like giving yeah. like those characters depth too because like yeah. i really loved that it twisted i think that was like honestly one of the last like slasher mm-hmm. like narratives that we truly enjoyed like we were watching i was like oh, wait, what is this? <laughs> Um, and like being on the like the part, like we gotta go watch, it. sit down and watch. Forget whatever else we're doing. We're gonna finish this. Um, and it's been a long time since like a slasher has made me feel that way. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, okay. that's a, I mean that's valid. You know, like I think like we said, like in the eighties they were written off as just dumb entertainment, which admittedly they were. Well, there's more to them than that as well. But yeah, it's like <laughs> I do think what's happened is people have learned from the Scream franchise and how much people connect to Sydney and Gail and Dewey mm-hmm. and they've realized oh if we make these characters better right. and richer people will actually give a shit and then we can make some big dollars because people will come back for the sequels mm-hmm. so I think that's how we end up getting characters like Tree and fewer you know sorority row movies where people you know they're fun but it's also yeah. like okay well we'll just make these <clears throat> girls a bunch but, of bitches but that's the difference though right like scream people are coming back for Sydney, gale and dewey they're not coming yeah. back for Ghostface. whereas yeah. like friday 13th mm-hmm. or nightmare on elm street they're coming back yeah. for freddie and jason not the yeah. characters which i wonder yeah. is that's why they've had difficulty with those reboots is because they continually mistake mm-hmm. what the interest is yeah yeah, that's yeah. that's so interesting, um, and very true, very true. Because like you know, Sydney is that final girl that you, I just will always have a place in my heart. <laughs> it's like oh, yeah. I love her. Like there's just her like panic face and just like just she can get so sad so quick, um, and it's so good. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to ask because. Um, I, I know Kat and I definitely hate whenever we're asked, like, what's your favorite horror movie? Because we don't really have one because mm-hmm. there's That's too, so hard. too much. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, and you're not going to like our answer. Um, but we got asked on some kind of show recently that was like, what is you, like your favorite subgenre? Like mm-hmm. what gets to you? Yes. <laughs> it's just like, which was the one that gets you? Because like for us, it's different. Right. And so it's like for... Um, like, yeah, what, which kind of subgenre of horror do you really just enjoy? Whether it's because it... it it really gets under your skin and you get afraid or just like that, you know, you're going to have a good time <laughs> in some way when you watch this. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my, my go-to is for like, oh, I need like something to like 
have fun and like just have a good day. It's either going to be a slasher or aquatic horror. Um, creature features in general are really fun for me, but I do gravitate towards the water-based um, creature features because I just yeah. think they're really fun. For what gets under my skin, like really like disturbs me, it's body horror. Like I don't, mm. I don't often put a lot of them on because it, that those are things that really like like skin anything like. In real life, that's terrifying, and so watching it transpire on screen is just like really like you know it's like when someone like, like if they someone's like oh I have scabies and then you automatically start itching because you're like oh my god do I have it too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, not a Cronenberg yes. fan, or is that I mean too, like, I, I, that's I am a enough. fan, but I, yeah <laughs> I just like I don't want to like just go put on the fly or like <laughs> yeah, yeah or it's shivers. not his first choice. Yeah, gotcha. Whereas it is my first choice. Right. I'm I'm a huge Cronenberg fan, so I love the body horror stuff. Uh, I'm very much the same. I like uh, creature features, and I'll extend it to aquatic, but also space horror. I'm mm. liking that. And then the thing that gets under my skin is dread lately. Like films that are just saturated in darkness and grief, and just kind of wallowing in it, and it's not that it affects me, but I find that it can be done badly. But when it's done well, those, I think, are some of the most iconic horror films that we've produced. And filmmakers have been doing a really good job of it lately. Like, shout out to probably my top three horror film of the year is uh, Dark and the Wicked, which is just mm. unbearably drenched in dread. And from the director of The Strangers, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Love yeah, I strangers. haven't seen it yet. I've seen it. Just, it just came out. It just came out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was in October. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe like the first week of November. So, yeah. <laughs> um, that's so funny that uh, you both said aquatic uh, horror that's and my then biggest space fear. Because <laughs> Are those yours? <laughs> All time. Well, Kat is terrified of the ocean. Yes. And I'm terrified of space. <laughs> okay. Well, so like... Joe, Joe did a lecture actually for um, some Toronto horror series um, where yes, he, he. The Black Museum. Yeah, and he basically like, compared though, like how aquatic horror and space horror are actually very, very similar. Um, mm-hmm. To where, like, if you saw like the Kristen Stewart movie Underwater from earlier this year, like it's an underwater movie, but it feels very much like a space movie. Yeah. Yeah, you're stuck in a thing. Mm-hmm. And if that thing doesn't work, then you're done. Yeah. Because yeah. you're not supposed to be there otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the terrifyingness of this environment that literally just wants to kill you. Yeah. yeah. You don't belong here. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, like, honestly, the xenomorph can come get me. <laughs> yeah. I, why am I here? What am I doing? We should I want to be taken out right? as early as possible. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. I'd love to say that I would be the first to die in any horror movie because I know everything what not to do. And I would just immediately like run and fall down a chute and just get eaten or something. <laughs> yeah, I just want a quick death. Like, don't yeah, just like kill me immediately. I think the stress of trying to survive would like do me in. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, having a heart attack over on the that. side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you have no idea what could happen. So much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't even watch ocean films. That, like just like the fact that mm. like the documentaries that show you what is in the ocean. I'm like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. This is a horror film. What? Yeah. There are bugs that eat your bones. Yep. But yeah. like, what if that was on land? Like, no. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's Kat, terrifying. you had such a good year this year then, too, with, like, sea fever and the beach house, like, just Ugh. all of your worst They're fears. On the list. <laughs> oh. on the list. We're not allowed to watch the alligator one. I already know I'm not watching that. It looks ridiculous, Crawl. but terrifying. Oh, Crawl's oh, so good. No. Crawl is super fun. Crawl's but like a slasher so film with crocodiles. With crocodiles. Or alligators, which <laughs> yeah, it's alligators, you're right. Yeah. This is Florida, right? Yeah, I <laughs> so when we did um we did a isolation series, um, and that's where we kind of found we were like, Well, Kat already knew she was afraid of the ocean, but a part of that was covering Big Planet. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was just like terrified of this. And then uh the zombie space, I was like hyperventilating talking about gravity because I was like, mm-hmm. the so whole good. Time, I was having a panic attack. Oh yes. yeah. That whole my, movie. My, I took my husband to go see Gravity, and it was like the 3D IMAX screen, and he oh, he so did good. have a panic attack during it, and like had to like look down. I don't even think he remembers the movie to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Just blacked it out. Yeah. Well, especially if you have like any kind of empathy, because she's like she's hyperventilating, mm-hmm. and so then I was I was like, you need to calm down for us. Like you need to like chill out because it's not good for us right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like I feel I am also in space, and I don't know why. Um, it's so good. Uh, so we don't 
th those are what scare us like in a genuine way um but the thrill way uh for me is found footage i mm. love found footage horror okay um specifically and just like if you give me an excuse for a camera to be there i will wholeheartedly believe it i'm like okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's real now and all this is real i believe you disbelief <laughs> suspended <laughs> Let's go. But it's so real um, now, too, right? Like, we do live in a world where people will film anything and everything about their lives. So for me, whenever people talk about, oh, found footage, it's so unbelievable. They'd put the camera down. You're like, I have seen people hold the camera in the dumbest of situations. Like, <laughs> you should be running. You should not be photographing this. And yet there you are, camera in hand. Mm. Yes, so true. Um yeah, and it's cameras are everywhere now, yep. and so it's like you could just get really creative. Um, I'm pretty excited for that. I mean, host was fun. No, th th that's I, I, I've I've told this to Joe countless times. Like, found footage is a really easy subgenre to fuck up, but yep. it's all and it's really hard to do well. But when it is done well, it's like really exceptional. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And cheap budget Roy generally. Well, I think because people that are doing found footage are like, oh, this is easy. Like, I can be, yeah. I can make it. Like, I can make a shitty film because it's someone holding a camera. I mean, that's not that's not the, how you need to go into that with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually, you gotta get creative. I actually think though that you can expand that out to a lot of horror in general because you can do it on the cheap. Like, you can be an amateur filmmaker and make a horror film because you just think, okay, I need bodies, I need frights, and right. for me, that's another reason why people tend to dismiss the genre is because you can make it for so cheap that we get this influx every fucking year. Right. But if you notice, we always end up gravitating to like certain types of films and it's like, they're done well. Dep it, mm -hmm. They may be in completely different subgenres. They might be found footage. They might be space, but the films that do it well end up being these films that live on in perpetuity or end up on the best of lists and those kinds of things. Yeah, because they're intentional. Mm -hmm. like intentional horror is what sticks with people. And you're like, oh, this is somehow connecting to the core of my fear and not just like this superficial, like, like, because I love jump scares. I get, mm -hmm. Like, if you can, if you get genuinely, if you can get me, me, then you earned it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. Um, and there is a thrill to that. But I, I, there's something about, like you were saying, like with dread horror, like those, those tales that like just stick with you mentally. Like, I would say, like, I understand people not liking hereditary, yeah. but I can still like hear yeah. like the scream mm -hmm. of that mother. Like, and I can see that scene like yeah. for forever, for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, we'll never be able to let that go. The same. I mean, like, we didn't love Midsummer. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's definitely not one of our favorites for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, upon review, it, it's not our least favorite either. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's that, still mine, but yes. <laughs> That, that, contracted is our that, oh, that's fair. Oh, that's oh contracted oh, sucks. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, Joe, you might have felt similarly, but I felt that way about The Lodge this year, where like we saw The yeah. Lodge and I was like, I didn't really like that much. And granted, yeah. it sat with me, like it stuck with me for a long time. And I do want to watch it again, like on its own terms, knowing what it is. But I'm also like not in a rush to like dive back in and go watch The Lodge again. Yeah. <laughs> But it's tough, right? Yeah. Because we recognize that those films are really well made. They have a very clear sense of purpose. It's always so confusing, especially when you watch a lot of horror films and you think, this should be my bag. And I don't understand. Why is this not working for me? Oh, God, am I ruined? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, we because we definitely went into Midsommar like, OK, this is going to be good. Like, you know, we had enjoyed Hereditary or at least like got something out of it. Right. And we were so disappointed and so upset. Like we were very viscerally upset by it because of some of the um, just disservices to, to specific communities. Mm -hmm. And we were just like, oh, don't do that to us right at the beginning. Right. Ruin mm -hmm. our entire emotion. Um, but there are parts of the, that film that do stick with you in just like that agony mm -hmm. that these characters have and the actors being so phenomenal so there's like some credit that we can give to that yep. and i think it's like finding those little like buckets of joy <laughs> or buckets of sorrow i guess yeah uh, in, in horror that you can like cling to and be like this is why <laughs> i think that's what determines though what kind of a film watcher you are be it like just an average viewer or even a critic you know like looking for the positive like yes yeah, so y'all found things you didn't like in that movie because it, it's like you can't find things not to like that that's just part of the world and part of art in general. But when you were still able to like, despite maybe something that gave you a visceral reaction like that, but you can still find something or some things in it that you do like say, you know, I feel this way about this movie. 
and it I don't like it. I hate it. But that being said, this part did work for me, you know? Yeah. 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 I think it's also the benefit of being part of like a podcast or having somebody else is that you're made to actually explain yourself and start to think through yeah. why things do and don't work. Like one of the joys of doing the podcast with Trace is that we've had so many opportunities to change each other's minds. Like we mm-hmm. have this infamous Patreon episode about Dr. Sleep where we get so fucking mad at each other because I <laughs> really didn't like it. And Trace and I love it. fucking loved it. And we just like rip at each other for 50 minutes <laughs> And I, I really came to appreciate the things that work for other people. It didn't work for me, but, you know, and it's one of those things where, again, like, I think, okay, I should go back and rewatch the film on its own terms and maybe watch the director's cut and see, like, what's missing. But I, I love the conversations that can come out of films, even films that we don't find as successful as other mm. people do. Yeah. 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 And it, it's also, like, we been we've been doing this for three years with the ghouls and so like you know we always talk about putting our media analysis glasses on yep. yeah and i was like i think over these like three like i don't know if i've ever been able to take it off now like yeah <laughs> no matter what i'm watching i'm just like always like watching it watching it and i feel like i was like it's not that i'm not enjoying these things no but yeah it feels surreal to to remember a time when I was like just just casually watching, watching the, yeah, just like, Whoa. <laughs> you know, I, I experienced that at film festivals though, because usually like I split film festival coverage duties with like someone else with bloody disgusting, and so like I like okay when I'm walking into a film that I have to review, I'm like okay cool, I've got to like. I mean, I am like in a mode here, but when I can just like, when I'm not reviewing a film, I'm like, oh, it's like, it's like a break almost. So like, even though like you, you're right, I mean, I'm, I'm still watching it with a critical eye, but it's like my brain like relaxes a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Give me an alcoholic milkshake. I'm just going to enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I think, um, yeah, uh, there's a few times when I can just watch a horror movie because I wanted to and not because it's for the show. Like it's not our mm-hmm. homework. Like I made myself, um, I watched Wounds. Oh, oh, I did too, okay. actually. <laughs> and I was like very disappointed, but I, it was on my list for yeah. so long where I was like, I was like, that's it. I was like, I don't have any reason for it to like go into the ghouls right now, like, it, but whatever. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch it by myself. Yep. And mm-hmm. I'm just going to like sit here and treat myself to a film, <laughs> whether I'm going to like it or not. Um, and I, at the end, I was just like, I'm so glad I did that. No, <laughs> the problem with that movie is when it ends, like that's when it starts to get good. But yes, <laughs> it just ends. I was like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Thanks. <laughs> it's like, okay, hour and a half for what now? What we're mm-hmm. doing? Um, this guy just driving around town, <laughs> being awful. Being angry. <laughs> <laughs> just being angry, way, dude. Like, I was like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Here. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I let's because we're we're running to the end of yeah. this episode, um, so it'll probably be like our crash course in She Dies Tomorrow, but we did watch something um, and you all suggested She Dies Tomorrow um, so the brief synopsis that Kat found for this is Amy thinks she's dying tomorrow and it's contagious um, I am DB <laughs> I'm to be. Uh, I love their descriptions because they're very very like six like, so <laughs> yeah. alright y'all said y'all had thoughts on this yeah. What, what, what did you think? What did you think? It was a time. Yeah. To say the least. Uh, th- I The beginning, it was kind of slow for us mm-hmm. to get in here. It was a lot of confusion of the very, very beginning of, you know. Yeah, what is happening? Um, what are the time periods? Are we jumping back and forth? I'm very confused. What are we, who is this? Why? Um, listening to Mozart over and over again. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love that. I think it happens like six. No, it is, it is six. T- I clocked it. 16 minutes of watching this woman just be depressed yeah like yeah. it is 16 minutes of an 84 minute movie mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah and it definitely feels i felt every minute yeah. of the 16 mm-hmm. minutes um and it, getting to like the the strobe light it, it's it got interesting to me when the friends mm-hmm. like went home and then it kind of clicks and i was yeah. like yeah because it's not just about aliens? one person, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden you're wondering, like, yeah. so is it contagious? Is it in their mind? Is it something larger? Like, and you you constantly keep wondering, okay, are we going to get answers? And I feel like about, nope. yeah, like maybe 20 to Never 25 minutes answers. in, you're like, 
oh, this is going to be one of those movies where but, it's going to be whatever you think it is. But then it's also darkly comedic. Like, whenever so Katie Adelson and Chris Messina, like, go and, like, hug their daughter, and she's like, are you drunk? Yes! Like, <laughs> it, it, but, but it, it it's so timely, because it basically is a pandemic movie, but then yeah. it's also, like, a metaphor for depression and anxiety. And mm-hmm. what I love about, like, even how it ends, where it's like, oh, like, nothing gets solved, because, unfortunately, like, depression, anxiety, and mental illness isn't something that can just be solved. Like, you can take medication for it, but it's still a daily struggle that's going to keep continuing. And this movie is like the embodiment of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like how the different people cope with that, Mm -hmm. different ways of kind of dealing with like where they're like safe areas are like the fact the friend is like i need to be with someone right now yes. like i am so aware of how alone i am and then like the family like them like gravitating towards their daughter mm-hmm. um i think the the scene where she's at the the friends at the doctor oh and yeah he's like i just can you hum for me and then it's like this whole weird thing and i was just like like that was very comedic to me but also i was just, I was like, now, I was like, it's 100% weird. Like, yes. <laughs> it's I, just going to be like this. I think that's right. I mean, like, it, it's all very awkward. I mean, I would even go as far as to say sometimes even cringy. But I think it's also because of that's, like, we're, we're basically forced to watch these people in depressive states. And that's not something that really gets shown a lot or that people want to talk about a lot. So it's almost like opening this conversation up through the lens of a genre film which is why I like, I mean, it's not something that I want to like, I'm not going to go back and like, just watch She Dies tomorrow all the time because it's, just, it's, <laughs> it's 84 minutes, but it feels probably about two and a half hours long. And yeah. that's, it's a lot. No, normally that's a critique for me. I actually like this a lot more than I thought I would because I knew going in, oh, it's going to be like an art house film. Make of that what you will. It's prestige. Um, it's elevated. So I had to like, I had, I had to like adjust my brain. And, okay. This is what I'm going to get. But I, and I was like, I'm, this is probably going to be one of those three star films where I'm like, oh, I see why people like it, but it's not really for me. I actually did really really and, and this is my second time seeing this um i i still really enjoyed it but i do you do feel that runtime because it's just people being depressed yeah. for 80 yeah. minutes <laughs> yeah this to me actually feels like a good example of a dread film but it's not trying to make you feel like oh there's something malicious happening it's more just exposing the fragility of how we feel when we realize our own mortality and like mm-hmm. I don't know about you folks, but I spent a fair amount of this runtime sympathizing and empathizing with these people, but also being like, what would I do if those lights just hit me and I realize I've got a couple of hours left? Like, it's so good for putting you into that mind space. Even, like, bringing out people's true colors. Like, whenever the guy, like, euthanizes his dad and his girlfriend's like, I was waiting for him to die so I could break up with you. I mean, I was going to wait like three months, you know, to not be an asshole about it. But and I'm like, yeah. that's also like, I, I think it's very refreshing. It's like, oh, I'm yeah. going to die tomorrow. So I might as well just fucking get it all out there. Right. Yeah. yeah and I love how she laughs it. on the phone while he's like freaking out uh, mm-hmm. when they first realize what's happening. Like just the, the gamut of reactions is fascinating to me. Yeah, that whole conversation about the dolphins. Oh. <laughs> and it's like, and it goes on for so long. And she's like, I just want to talk about dolphins fucking. Yeah. <laughs> Which, like, it, 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 it might, some of my watch this and be like, this is weird, this is out of place. But I'm also like, yeah, but you know what, though? I've been to like a oh, friendly gathering that like that. Yeah, where we get like into this yeah. stupid conversation about some random, be it sex or just some stupid innocuous thing. But granted, I can see what if you're a movie watcher, you're like, oh, this isn't like I don't want this is too real and it makes me uncomfortable. Um, And that's something that you definitely have to grapple with, I think, with a film like this. Yeah. Cat when so we were watching like remotely mm-hmm. and we like chat with each other as it's going and she brought up that it to her it was similar to Melancholia. Which yes, I oh. mm-hmm. it's very Melancholia. I mean, it's almost like it's very, very like a twin film to it in that like we are talking about depression and also just like accepting what everything is yeah. like just being like yeah this is how it is i'm not gonna put any effort into it because we only have so much time you know like, yeah. the funny yeah. thing is too that melancholia is a two and a half hour movie yeah i genuinely love melancholia. oh i do too it's great i yeah it's definitely what, like i forced cat to watch it and had we had like a whole like our, our apocalypse series and it was like our cosmic one we ended with it which was like the most depressing of all of the mm-hmm. apocalypses Ooh, you really built to it so cat <laughs> cat cat though so are you are you pro melancholia or are you like yeah, yeah I, not for me i get it yeah i definitely get it <laughs> oh so diplomatic um, <laughs> and it's like it was just like so sad and i was yeah. just like oh. this is it 
what I want to feel ever. <laughs> this is awful. Yeah. And it's I feel like so much of socialize like I'm an introvert at my core. So mm-hmm. like so much of socializing is putting on those airs. It's like putting mm-hmm. on that yeah. like persona where you have to put so much effort into like making sure you're nice to everybody and making sure like and then like if all gloves are off, all be- like it's just the end. It's like I don't even know what society would be. I imagine it'd be very reminiscent of like assassination nation, but without a goal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So like everything is just, I hate you. (laughs) We're fighting. If there's no goal, then there's no point to life. That's that's why religion exists, right? Is to give us something to like go to aim for in our afterlives. And yeah, I I think you're right though. You know, it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to feel this way, but both melancholia and she dies tomorrow it's kind of making you feel like oh like it again it's i wouldn't call them horror films but they're definitely under that genre umbrella because yeah. it is scary it is a scary yeah. thought and that the at least melancholia and maybe should i tomorrow can make you feel that way make you feel like you're in these characters headspace that is powerful to me and whether mm-hmm. or not like i mean yeah, again, yeah. i don't enjoy watching it <laughs> <laughs> but i appreciate it I think what I love yeah. though is the the elegant simplicity of She Dies Tomorrow. Like this movie was mm-hmm. obviously made on just a shoestring budget. Ten dollars. <laughs> Amy Simons clearly phoned in. Like she went through her Rolodex and said, "Who are all my famous friends? They're going to come and act for free in this movie. It's not <laughs> fancy, and yet it's so effective." And I really love that because I do, again, think it shows the power of genre filmmaking, which is like you can get to these really like heady topics and really touch people emotionally. But you don't need a hundred million dollars and like an FX budget that's out the wazoo. It feels like a stage play almost. That's that's how I feel about She Dies Tomorrow. It's very Mm -hmm. stagey. Yeah. But not in a bad way. Yeah. No. (laughs) No, no. Yeah, I think it to me it felt very like therapeutic mm-hmm. and cathartic to like kind of walk through those. Like even at the like at the end that night after I watched it, I like turned to my partner and I was like, "What would you do?" <laughs> yeah. I said I was going to die tomorrow. Like what <laughs> like how do we yeah. deal with this? Um and it was like a genuine conversation. Mm-hmm. Um we do a lot of weird what ifs, so he was fine with it. But it was it was very much just like a <laughs> like what do we do mm-hmm. yeah. when we're dealing with with like our impending doom or just like the fact that you know we are mortal and is our life meaningless like does yeah. any of this matter that, that's yeah. the ultimate scare i think right like what if life has no purpose what if life is meaningless like and i think that's something that again because that's why we have religion but like that that's what's scary like what if that was true what if we just cease to exist after we die that's it yeah. See, I yeah. don't look at it as religion. I just look at it as podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Kat, what, are, what about you? What were some of your thoughts for the film? I really, I did like it. I don't want anyone to think I didn't like it. I thought it was really cool. It's, it was beautifully done. It's okay done. if you didn't, just so you know. <laughs> it was it's just okay definitely just like... like <laughs> it was just like very... It does a very good job at making you feel like that dread. And it was also just like... I I just find it so stressful when the gloves are off and those kinds mm-hmm. of things because it's like you work so hard to understand what human interaction expectations are like when you're not good at it. So it's mm-hmm. like when that no longer is a thing, it's like all my studying is over. Like, what was it for? <laughs> Everyone's yeah. just going to say exactly how they feel. What do we do now? Um, <laughs> and I definitely thought that was really stressful. The only part of the movie that genuinely confused me to no end was the part where the one friend who does the things with the Petri dishes is suddenly just like in a different place with a pool and everyone else there is like, I'm there too. And it's like, what? (laughs) So I I took that as because she's clearly lost it because she's like talking to the bacteria in her Petri dish as as friends to like cope with this. Yeah. And so she just wanders around. Like we we don't know why she's bleeding. Like we don't know what she did to Uh, herself. No, it's her brother and her stepsister stabbed her. Oh, okay. Got it. Sorry. Um, But she walks into. They did say they had to do something. She walks into a stranger's house and it's Michelle Rodriguez and some other girl. Yeah. But I actually like that we end with them as like the, the. before we get the ending with the main the main girl um where she goes to like be like okay can you turn my skin into leather um but it's almost like there's like the way michelle rodriguez and her roommate slash partner we don't know um 
they're like almost like content with everything, right? Yeah. Like they're the ones that are like, we're fine. We're going to die. We're just going to enjoy this day of existence that we have. And I think that's a really good way that I think it's smart that Simon's chose to make that the kind of like last little episode that we're seeing. I think it's also a a nice counterpoint, right? We've seen people really grappling with it and getting emotional and getting vengeful and weepy. And this is people who are like, oh, if I found out, I would be okay with that. I mean, I also Mm -hmm. think they're on drugs, but... uh, Oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) But also that shot, though, when Jane Addams is in the pool and you just see the blood as they're just like, like, it's such a pretty shot. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other actor in that is the girl from The Magicians. Yes, you're right. Oh, yes. that's why she looks I familiar. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, there's... Uh, yeah, and I was, like, excited to see her because I was looking up actors. Um, mostly because the main actor, her speech delivery, and this is probably because I had just watched Wounds, but reminded me of Dakota. Uh, oh, Johnson. I can see that. that. She was, like, that deadpan, like, mm-hmm. so yeah. that, I... Like, I kept trying to figure out what I knew her from because she looked so familiar to me. And it was, she's the opening, she's one of the opening people in your next. Um, oh, right. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. I watched that recently. I'm surprised I didn't catch that. I okay. mean, I, again, this, I didn't catch it until my second viewing of this movie, but I had to like look it up and I was like, oh, because they're all in that same family, that mumble core yeah, horror the family. family. Sacrament yeah. and VHS as well. Yeah, she, and she is in the Sacrament. Yeah, exactly. She's in the Ty West segment of VHS, which would make sense as to why she's in the Sacrament. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it was. I I definitely think it's worth a watch for for listeners. Um, totally different from mm-hmm. our film we watched with Zena, which was The Spell from 1977. <gasps> oh, <fun>. <laughs> <laughs> this is like exciting because it's like, it's like whiplash. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what are we gonna watch with you know these people? And it's I it's honestly super fun because it's like I don't think I don't know if we would have found She Dies Tomorrow or like given it a try. Mm-hmm. Um, Without this. So thank yeah. you. Oh, good. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. So it's good. super great. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was cool. So, <laughs> with our uh, cat, do you have any last questions for our friends? Uh... It's okay what if the answer's no. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I could come up with one. Uh, what are you excited for going into 2021? I guess if there's like anything. <sighs> I don't know, man. I hope we. I hope I get to see the new Saw movie and the new Halloween movie. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't care if it's in a theater, or if it's on streaming. Like, I just want to see like something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would echo that, except I'll swap out Halloween because who could give a fucking oh, for Candyman? I'll swap it. Yeah, swap it out for Candyman. That was my most anticipated film of this year, and I so desperately wanted to see it. Yes, I'm right there with you. I'm yeah. We had it like on our list. We kept pushing. We keep pushing our list yep, back for yep. uh, doing like black horror because we're just like no. No, <laughs> yeah. It, it, you want to build we, that centerpiece around it because it's it is going to be a game changer. We were gonna do Candyman two when Candyman came out, and finally after it got pushed again, we were like, fuck it, we'll just do Candyman two. Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We covered uh, the original Candyman to in preparation and then it got us even more excited yeah we're like what yeah if people were intentional <laughs> could have like even more intentional right? what if like, the film yeah. wasn't partially problematic <laughs> yeah what if like we didn't have to what make if? excuses for it <laughs> yeah so true um so for our listeners uh let's remind them where they can find you i have a little your little twitter at oh Queers. wow um, <laughs> As well as your personal Twitters, putting it out there. So for listeners, you can get Trace Thurman and B stole my remote. That that is a fancy ass video tool. I mean, I'm sure it's probably not fancy for you, but I'm like boggled right here. Ooh, technology. <laughs> uh, so much of Very exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, where can they find some of the things that you've written and and you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you can find a lot of my writing on Bloody Disgusting. I've written for Consequence of Sound a few times. I even reviewed Midsummer for them, but I gave it a very good score. <laughs> it's true. Okay. I got like 3,000 retweets or something. Oh, oh yeah. Um, but then, yeah, mostly Bloody Disgusting. But obviously, since Joe and I have really gotten like, like, we're, we're, we're pretty busy with the podcast, so I actually don't write as much anymore. But, you know, go find me on the socials at that screen name. So, <laughs> Right. And uh, I also write for Bloody and Consequence of Sound occasionally that, sh- that shelf. And I also have my own uh, website called QueerHorrorMovies.com. Nice. I... That sounds very familiar and probably where I found some of the suggestions for December. Oh, <laughs> oh nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you both 
both so much for joining us and uh, geeking out with us about horror and what we love about it. It's always exciting. This has been such a great like series. Um, you know, it's refreshing to kind of like hear other people that love it and understand mm-hmm. um, how important horror is yes. and what it could do. Um, and it's like, oh, we're not alone because sometimes I feel <laughs> it's like validating. we're on this little island. <laughs> yeah, you're having the conversations with the two of you, and you're like, is anybody else out here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you said that. I, I, I understand that feeling perfectly. Like, it's it's very, very true. Yes. Um, but, yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, and, and listeners, make sure you check out Horror Queers. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Cat. Don't get married. <laughs> Don't get married. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? Why? Uh. <laughs>